Hey everyone, it's May. Welcome to another episode of The May Lee Show. Uh, so I got to tell you guys, I am a little tired. I am kind of feeling worn out. It's uh, the month of May and uh, we're coming towards the end of the month, but it's been a really busy time uh, for a lot of us because May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. So of course, we've all been trying to elevate our voices and focus on different issues, our history, different stories. And there's been a level of awareness that has been raised, um, obviously because of everything that's been going on the, year, the last year and a half with the anti-Asian hate crimes and assaults. Uh, and so people are showing a lot more interest. And when I say people, I mean not just Asians, I mean non-Asians, uh, companies, organizations, are showing a lot more interest in learning more about who we are uh, what the AAPI community stands for, what we're made of, and that we're not a monolith, and that we have a long history. So I've been participating in a lot of different uh, speaking engagements and panels and discussions and events. Um, I just recently was invited to be a speaker at a rally put on by Compassion San Gabriel Valley. And for those of you who are not from uh, Southern California, SGV is an area... Uh, of Southern California, just east of Los Angeles. And it has a really big Asian population and fantastic food, Chinese food, by the way. Uh, but anyway, Compassion SGV is a group that started not too long ago by a few women um, who finally said enough is enough. They saw what was happening and they wanted to do something to help. So they were inspired to put together a small group of volunteers to organize and to help their community um, by way of just more information and education and providing escort services for elderly so that they can get to and from places safely. And so they put together this rally called Block the Hate. And I took part in it. It was really just inspiring for me um, because when I see young people being so motivated, to not just talk the talk, but to walk the walk like this group is doing and to really show that energy and empowerment and see that they are making a difference, that they are using their voices and what little resources they have to prove to everyone that you can make a difference. Each one of us can make an effort to make a difference. And so it was a hugely successful event and I was so, so happy to participate. So keep doing the work, ladies. You're doing a great job. I should say ladies and gentlemen, because it's, it's obviously both, but uh, it was started by Brittany Owl. Um, and uh, so I give great kudos to all of them uh, in terms of the work that they're doing. Uh, so anyway, so we're, you know, definitely uh, about to close out the month of May. Um, and today's episode, I uh, interview Ludi Lin. He is a Chinese born Canadian actor whose latest film is Mortal Kombat. And I know there are a lot of Mortal Kombat fans out there. That's, of course, like the original video game that started decades ago. Listen, I'm not a video game player, and I admit that to Ludi in this interview. So I never really was that familiar with Mortal Kombat, but of course we all know that it's a, you know hugely popular as a video game. And then they made it into a series of movies in the mid-1990s. But the problem with that series was that even though the original video game, the characters were mostly Asian or people of mixed race, the movie cast mostly white people to play those characters. So it pretty much missed the mark that way, of course, when it came to proper representation. So this new version, the reboot of Mortal Kombat, definitely uh, sought to correct that because most of the actors in the movie are Asian or of mixed race, like their characters. And Ludi Lin plays Liu Kang, the character in, in Mortal Kombat, um, and I have to say, even though I'm not a Mortal Kombat video game fan, I'm a huge fan of action movies, believe it or not. And it's because I grew up with an older brother. So I love action movies. And I remember somebody saying to me before I saw it, they're like, oh man, you know, it's pretty violent. The movie's pretty violent. I'm like, please, I can take it. I mean, I, that doesn't bother me. 
I totally enjoyed it. I thought the choreography and the martial arts, obviously, the action scenes, the sequences were amazing. Um, and Ludi and I talk about, of course, the movie, but we also talk about his upbringing. We talk about what's going on in the world right now with anti-Asian hate. We talk about representation. Uh, and we talk just about, you know, growth, continued growth as an individual. And um, he definitely surprised me in many ways with the things he was sharing with me. So here is that interview with Ludi Lin. Hi, Ludi. Welcome to the show. Good to see you. Hey, May. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Um, great to have you on the show. Um, so, Ludi, I have to do true confessions to begin with. Um, Mortal Kombat, obviously, it's, it's, it's the latest movie that you were in. And I watched it because I'm a huge action, like, sci-fi and, like, you know, special effects kind of, you know, movie fan. But I never knew anything about Mortal Kombat. Never played the game, didn't know anything about it. So were you a fan of the game and, you know, the everything that followed since then? Yeah, well, I'm really surprised, mate. It's been around for a long time. I'm not sure... <laughs> <laughs> it's been around for a long, almost as long as I have. And I think maybe almost as long as you have. It's been around for 30, 30, 31 years, I think. Oh, has or it been around that even long? A little bit more than that. Oh my yeah. God. Okay. It's been through a lot of renditions. Okay. I've been around a lot longer than that. But, but having said that, yes, I know it's a hugely popular, popular game, but I really, I, I'm not a video game person. So I never really knew anything about the storyline. And that therefore, when this movie was about to come out, the fan base and the excitement and the anticipation was so unbelievable that I was like, what is happening? What is what is the what is the deal with this Mortal Kombat? Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's I mean, OK, so so I think we took a big bet on it because it's been around for so long and uh, none of us were sure how many fans there were out in the Mortal Kombat universe and, and how much they would embrace uh, a new movie. Yeah. Um, I know there's a lot of fans about, uh, of the old movies and it's become sort of an occult classic. It's like how these things come out. First they come out and then all the critics rag on it and uh, they, they pick it apart and then the fans really embrace it and then yeah. they end up making a second one. And that's how I kind of um, fell in love with the first movie too. And um, so we were joking around on set um, about breaking records and all this. And then the pandemic hit and it was all just no holds barred. Like nothing was predictable. No, nothing was certain, of, um, um, of course. But right. um, since it's come out, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, let me ask you that about the, about the pandemic because obviously nobody expected that. Nobody predicted that. And so therefore you guys had already done the movie. So were you preparing to release it in under normal circumstances? It was always meant to be a cinematic release because it was filmed in uh, in places where it's just um, you need to experience like the scope of yeah. the space in the Australian outback that actually looks like Mars or any other planet or outworld in Mortal Kombat terms. But um, and it was shot on such amazing cameras and these anamorphic lenses that it was meant to be an IMAX sort of film. Um, uh, and then, of course, the pandemic hit and everything has to be. Uh, reorganized and re strategized. Um, yeah. But look, to be honest, for for me, um, I'm open to how people want to experience the film or experience the story. As um, the more the merrier is how I go by. And for me, I actually got to see it in theaters. I was in Hawaii, and the day it came out was the first day they reopened all the theaters there. Oh. So I actually went into the theater and watched it with a whole bunch of friends. And it was an amazing experience. It was, cause I saw a screener at home before, Yeah. but I don't think anything can really replace that theatrical experience. Yeah. It's just not the same. It's, no. it's just not the same. No, it re no, Ludi, seriously. I mean, uh, that's why when I want to experience a movie like that, you know, or any kind of huge blockbuster that has a bunch of special effects and it, amazing choreography and, you know, martial arts like Mortal Kombat, you want to experience it on a huge screen, of course. And yeah, then, there, there is an element of um, kind of like an emergent property. Yeah. You know, when people get together, you get yeah. this sort of energy. Right. It's like, yeah, you laugh more, you, uh, 
you you uh, you 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 get excited more. You get that adrenaline rush because everyone's just speeding off each other. It applies to a lot of things. I of, think. Of course, you know, and people cheer together. I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but when I sit at home and watch a movie now, especially if if it evokes any kind of emotion, and I'm alone, I kind of feel weird if I like start crying or if I start laughing by myself. Whereas if you're in a theater experience you kind of feel a little bit more free to do that together, right? You know, because it's, it's like the collective experience. I uh, See, I wonder if that's like a male-female difference, like a woman-man difference or masculine-feminine, because, you know, like a lot of a lot of guys, I think they're they're um, reserved and, and shy to show their emotions. That's true. So I know when I watch sad movies at home alone, <laughs> You're I, yeah, I, I tend to get more emotional. Right. And also for Mortal Kombat, when I saw the fan reactions and I was alone and that really hit me. But when I saw the trailer, I was with an entire cast over zoom right. and we're like celebrating and that was cool. But when I was alone sitting there watching hundreds of people reacting to the trailer and how, you know, our hard work really paid off. Uh, that really made me, that touched me inside where I'm soft. Yeah, I'm, I like, bet it did. Girl. I mean, because you know, look, let's be honest, Ludi, this is a huge film, right? It's, it's, Probably the biggest movie you've been in. Is, is that correct? Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I don't know how to gauge that because actually the budget wasn't that big. Um, it's just the way we filmed it. Everything um, that we filmed was mainly physical. There, there wasn't that much CG involved. Mm. Um, so, and then all the, all the actors and stunt actors worked together so cohesively and we're all mostly all of us are martial artists. Right. So we actually managed to pull it off with a smaller budget than some films I've been in, like Aquaman and Power Rangers. Um, oh, right, of course, but, Aquaman, yeah, and Power Rangers, yep, yep. But I gotta say, it's the only film where when I was filming, um, I went, and I don't know if you, you get this when you're doing shows or, or chatting with someone or you know following a story, but when I was filming, this is the only time when I went, you know, I don't give a crap what people thought about it, what people think about it, um, because I'm having so much, such a good time. And I, I'm just, it was the experience. Oh, wow. Um, and then I'm glad people liked it. But yeah, I, I'm, there's been a lot of things that has changed in this project where I perceived, perceived like this whole industry or filmmaking or, or my, my job, my work yeah. differently. It's, it's been really interesting. No, I don't know. Maybe I had a stroke or something. <laughs> a mini stroke. Yeah, I think you're a little young for that. But um, but that's an no. But uh, let's let's dig into that for a second because I find that really interesting. The reason why, for many reasons, one is, you know, you are young and you are this star that's you know definitely rising, and you know you would think that someone in your position, getting these these kinds of roles that are bigger and obviously, you know, get, getting you a little bit more attention and fame that you would want more of that and that you would care more about your image and your reputation and because you want the next job and, you know, cause Hollywood is that way where it's just, you kind of have to be a little bit, you got to play that game, right? You got to play that game. Right. Do you not um, feel I guess that way? In, yeah. I, I know you've been in um, the the news news industry and the media industry for so long. Um, people ask me all the time what I think of the progress that you know Asian Asians and Asian Americans um, have made over the past, um, in my experience, over the past few, few years. But I'm really curious as to see what your experience has been through the last 10, 20 years in the industry. Yeah, listen, Ludi, I, mean, I started over 30 years ago. Right. Because right. I started right out of college. And um, back then, there were hardly any of us in the media, some on the local level, right, in local news here and there, just sprinkling. On the network level, it was only Connie Chung. She was the only one. Um, and so because when you're in an industry where there's such little representation, um, any position that is given to someone who is Asian is coveted. And it's almost like this scarcity, scarcity mentality, right? And that's what they call it when there's so few opportunities that we're all fighting over this one opening or this one role, right? And so that was a challenge all along the way because we were always seen as 
um, maybe, you know, being given a, a, a part here or, you know, a, a role here or, you know, a job there, but always seen as the minority, always seen as the other. Right. Whereas, you know, in news, you, you'll see a whole anchor desk full of white anchors and nobody ever thinks twice about that. Would you ever see a whole anchor desk full of Asians? No way. Not even to this day. So that always will, that has always made for huge challenges. Right. And it's always made us feel like, yeah, we need to fight harder because mm -hmm. we're not going to just be given a job, you know, um, and not looked upon as Asian. So right, yeah. And I, I know. I think in the beginning of your, of your career, you did. Um, you you covered Japan and Hong Kong. I yeah. Right? When I went overseas, yeah, I was based in Tokyo and then Hong Kong and then later in right. Singapore too. So I covered oh, a lot right. of Asia. So, so all the Asian places. And yeah. I think there's a um, sort of a parallel and a similarity in in Hollywood when you're making scripted stories as well, because you're seen as a representation of that entire culture. Yeah. You know, you're, you, you have an Asian look, so you could be Korean or you could be uh, Japanese or you can be Chinese. It doesn't really matter. It's just the generic Asian role. And it doesn't really matter what you say because nobody will understand that you can just mouth a bunch of things and, and right. read the read, read off the Chinese menu if you want. Um, <laughs> And then uh, just play it off, you know, as long as you're blinking right and your facial expressions are good, right. um, we're gamed. But um, I mean, look, as an, as, a, as an artist, I'm two minds about it, right? I would love it if, um, if it was just open. Like, I would love it if I could play any role of course. I want. Um, but I also love it to, to represent um, my own culture. I would love it to represent Asian culture because I'm truly, really um, into the similarities between all the different um, places in the Asian diaspora. Yeah. Um, but I just don't. I just don't like it that there's a someone else is putting the box on me. I think stereotype is a word when someone else, you know, puts you yeah. in that box. That's right. You know That's I mean? right. If, they, they yeah. get, other people are controlling our narrative, right, and our stories. And that has been the case in Hollywood, certainly, and media in general, where the decision makers and the people who are creating the content or creating the shows or creating the newscasts, they're, they're not part of the, of the culture, the community, and they lack an understanding, but it doesn't matter. They're still controlling that narrative, even to this right. day, even to this right. day, right? And right. so that's, I mean, I think you and I are definitely on the same page about that. It's just like, we have to start controlling our own stories and telling our own stories. And that's right. what's happening now, you know, with, with this anti-Asian hate, the explosion of what's going on, the silver lining is that, you know, AAPIs and Asians around the world are finally saying, no, we're not gonna be silent anymore. We're not gonna be invisible anymore. We yeah. are going to now take control of our own stories. Yeah, and, and I love that, and I love, um, I mean, I think there's positives to be drawn from every single experience, and there's been so much tragedy that um, that seeded this anti-Asian hate movement. Um, uh, and for me, I want to see that you know we're we're coming toward the light, hopefully, at the end of this COVID tunnel, and hopefully, we're going to see some light at the end of the anti-Asian hate tunnel, and right. we start seeing some love for Asians and some positivity in amplifying and conveying our stories and not just focused on the negative. Because, because you know, what's, what's really interesting for me that I've been thinking about, and I don't know how, how steeped in Asian culture you are while, while you were um, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in, in um, uh, covering Japan, right? So for me, what's been interesting is that, because I, I, I was born in China. Yeah. And I loved um, ancient Chinese myths, like from 5,000 years ago, from Qin Shi Huang, this, this, um, the ancient China, Chinese king that united all of China. And that's our founding myth, right? He's, the, he's, he's like, uh, he's been, uh, I guess, compared to the dragon. And we're all descendants of the dragon, right? He's the one dragon that, that um, united all of China. So for that, for those, those stories are kind of like the Marvel stories for me. That's yeah. what I, 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 that's what I, um, 
like lived, breathed, ate every single day. It's just those are my superheroes, all these figures from Chinese history. Do you think that these stories then um, that come out of China and, and, and other parts of Asia that you talk about um, that I know I'm familiar with some, of course, as well. Um, do you think that these stories can be told properly uh, to the world via Hollywood or some other means um, that would resonate, um, especially especially in the culture that we have now where, again, there, there are two different aspects of what's going on now. We, there's a the hate aspe aspect, of course, that's clear. And the blame game, the COVID blame game, right? It came from China and so all Asians are bad and evil. Uh, but then on the flip side, because of this raised awareness, there is this scramble, it seems, um, by industries across the board, including Hollywood, wanting <laughs> to have that better representation. So do you think this the time is ripe for this kind of storytelling that people would be a little bit more receptive? I I hope. <laughs> yeah, um, we all hope. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not I'm not too certain judging by the evidence because I I'm a uh, like a tragic optimist. So <laughs> I always hope. I always feel like we're making great progress and I always feel like there's always something to do. It's in the work that matters for me. Right. As, as long as something is 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 changing. I know things change takes time. It's just like forgiveness. It takes time. Just yes. like love. It takes time. Right. We always expect things to happen in a second, but not nothing happens in a second. Yeah. Things always take time. So I always hope. But then judging by the evidence, I don't know if you've seen this, um, this study that just came out out of um I think USC yeah, no, and no, Amazon no. about representation. That's Are you looking at booty. it right now? I was going to bring that up because <laughs> you know that I'm an adjunct professor at USC as well, right? So, um, And so the professors who worked on this, they're all amazing researchers. And so this uh, USC inclusion initiative always does these reports on representation and things like that. So yeah, you're talking about this latest report that came out of USC, their, their inclusion initiative that really examined Asian representation in Hollywood. And it is pathetic. Like it's the total erasure of Asians, pretty much the data shows, right? So let's share some of this. Only 5.9% of the top 1300 films from 2007 to 2019 included an API character. So less than 6%. And the speaking characters you know, there were 51,000 speaking characters overall, but only 3,000 were API descent. And then I think the funniest and saddest data point was that only 44 films cast an API lead or co-lead, but 14 of those films were starred Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Dwayne, The Rock Johnson. 31% <laughs> of the 44 films were with, with Dwayne, Rock, The Rock Johnson. And that was, I mean, that is extraordinary. Like, it's funny, but sad. So yeah, there's, um, what was that statistic? There's, um, I think one third. So that's about one third of the films were, um, were by Dwayne Johnson. Yeah, one third. And I love Dwayne Johnson. Oh, uh, we all love him, but <laughs> is he the <laughs> only? Is he the only Asian actor in Hollywood? I mean, yeah. Maybe, maybe he's got clones. Maybe we like him so much. <laughs> I mean, I mean, he's very, very busy. So he represents one third of us, and then the other two thirds, I think, um, I think, either die or get disparaged. Yes. disparaged. Yes. I think a quarter, a quarter a of the qu Asian roles end up dying. They end right? up dying before quarter, the end. That's of a quarter of six, under 6%. That's right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I can only, <laughs> I mean, I can only laugh. Um, I think this, the study was in conjunction with Amazon and I got into a bit of a, a bit of a Twitter spat with I some fans. I saw that too. Day about that um, yes you got an, it, it, you, it got well covered by all the publications that's for sure but let's tell everyone what you're talking about you uh you tweeted to amazon studios about their new lord of the rings series right right yeah and right. you said uh quote it's going to be difficult to justify building a huge world without any characters that look asian turn that imagine on us it's not hard we're right here yeah. I mean, I've been thinking about this for a long time because I'm a I'm a I'm a big nerd. And 
Um, I love fantasy. I love the Game of Thrones. I love Lord of the Rings. Um, and I think a lot of studios uh, covered the story with a headline saying I called certain people out. Um, I only responded because I was reading the article by um, by Amazon and by um, Jen Salks. And she's she's saying that she, they're building this massive world, the greatest ever, five hundred million dollar budget. Yeah. And Mortal Kombat was fifty million. That's ten Ooh. times Mortal Kombat. Wow. Okay. And we probably have ten times the amount of Asian characters in Mortal Kombat than them. You know. Right. So, so um, I wasn't calling her out. I was just saying that it's a it's a fantasy genre, um, and I'm enjoying some of these spats actually because um, in in Lord of the Rings, Tolkien did set some um, roots in the source material. And a lot of the fans are saying it's not in the source material. Um, I've been enjoying some of these comments saying, um, uh, for example. Yeah, I did see example, some of them. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, Hey idiot, there are no Asians in, in middle, middle earth. Yeah. In the middle. Yeah. It's a or, fantasy. It's like or, <laughs> or, or Asia doesn't exist in middle earth. Oh, I um, we got to respect 100% of the worlds that Tolkien wrote down, um, which is why they casted so many real world giant talking trees, elves, hobbits. That's representation. That's diversity. So some of these are <laughs> some of these are really quite funny. This story is based on Anglo-Saxon folklore. Nobody was crying that there was no white guys in Mulan. Um, there doesn't need to be Asians in Lord of the Rings. Guys, look, I'm not saying that there needs to be Asians. I'm just saying that we're actors. In yeah. Lord of the Rings, Tolkien set, um, I think, East of Ruin for the Easterlings to be Asian. Mm. Now, this is back in 1930s when stereotypes were even worse for oh, Asians. Wow. So now we're reimagining this world. Tolkien did set this, this seed for us to expand on. Right. So how come it's so inconceivable that but there's no But here's the thing, Ludi. I mean, I'm not a uh, Lord of the Rings nerd. Uh, so I don't know the details of that. So that's fascinating that you're sharing that with us about Tolkien. Uh, but just at face value, just just totally at face value, this is a fantasy. He created this fantasy world of, you know, warlocks and war whatever, elves and all these things, right? So why is it so hard to accept the idea, the mere idea that there are Asian looking people in this world? That's what I don't understand. So it's a very Anglo way of looking at the work of Tolkien, I guess, and and being, I, I think it, yeah, being very narrow-minded in terms of not allowing for any sort of, like you're saying in your tweet, imagination that would allow for a more expansive, you know, story. I, I, I mean, I, I like to listen to what they're coming back with and what they're saying, because I don't think people are actually lying. I want to I want to speak, but I want to listen as well. Yeah. So um, I guess that's a problem I have with um, not letting people talk is you rob people of the chance to listen. And I, I don't want I don't delete any comments. I mm -hmm. want the chance for me to listen to them. And I think they they're not lying. They actually feel this way. Sure. That in the source material, there's not this is our world. It's precious to me. If you change something in it, it's going to destroy that that precious childhood memory right this is why I'm, I'm i'm so psyched and stoked that i was in mortal kombat and power rangers as well because those are precious childhood memories of mine yeah and i as a person i'm not just me i'm like a community you know my little my little past selves i need to be responsible for them and my future future selves i need to be responsible for them as well right so when i listen to them i understand that they, they're coming from this world view and um and especially in Tolkien's worldview back in the day, it's very, maybe it is based on Anglo-Saxon history, but you know, the world is changing. Yes. And to be able to move forward, we need right. to change that worldview a little bit. We need to expand the idea of what our tribe constitutes. Exactly. Right? I, think, I think that's the only way to move forward. I mean, Ludi, I, I always say, if you can't see it, you can't be it, right? And that's nice. exactly your point, is that I grew up not seeing anyone who looked like me in the media, in movies, in television. D you know that the one character I remember um, on television was in a commercial, and it was horrible for me because my last name is Lee, and this commercial was a Calgon commercial about laundry detergent, and it was a Chinese couple who owned this laundromat, 
and this white woman comes into the laundromat saying, how do you get your shirt so clean, Mr. Lee? <sighs> and he goes, ancient Chinese secret. And then the wife goes in the back and said, oh, I'll tell you what the secret is. It's Calgon, right? How do you get shirts so clean, Mr. Lee? Ancient Chinese secret. My husband, some hotshot. Here's his ancient Chinese secret, Calgon. Calgon's two water softeners soften wash water so detergents clean better. In hardest water, Calgon helps detergents get laundry up to 30% cleaner. We need more Calgon. Ancient Chinese secret, huh? Calgon helps detergents get laundry up to 30% cleaner. I remember that commercial verbatim because it's seared in my mind because people kids would make fun of me all the time saying, mm. oh, is your, do your parents own that laundromat? You know, cause again, my last name is Lee and I was the only Asian in town. So that's all I remember in terms of growing up and not having seen anyone else who looked like me. So it was a very negative, you know, memory. So for young people now and you, I mean, doing the work that you're doing, it's so impactful. It's so important because again, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So do you, do you, um, do you have a laundry, laundry mat phobia? No. <laughs> no. Are you, are you, are you, uh, or? <laughs> yeah. Let's put it this way. I never use Calgon. <laughs> is, is there still Calgon? You know what? I don't know. Calgon Actually, I don't, time. that's a good question. I don't know, but guess what? Probably, Subconsciously, I bet yeah. I, if it still existed when I, you know, was doing laundry, I bet I totally avoided it because of that negative association. <laughs> yeah. That's really interesting. It is, you know, because because a lot of people um, uh, uh, tell me, and when they when they talk to me, we talk about this thing of different stereotypes, like especially the martial arts stereotype. Yeah. When we do something that's martial arts, they go, you know, how are you breaking your, any stereotypes if you're if you're just buying into that martial artist role or your your I'm on the show called Kung Fu and yeah. it's literally Kung Fu, and so um, but for me it's it's not about because I if I like we we mentioned about um, letting other people tell our story or telling the story ourselves. I think that's the difference in stereotype. If I get to express myself as I want to, as I feel like uh, truly deep inside who I am, then it's no longer a stereotype because I'm taking that narrative and I'm representing it. Right. Just like, um, just like uh, for black people, no one would say that, uh, no one would say hip hop sucks because it's a terrible stereotype, Yeah. right? It's just a part of the culture. And martial arts, as long, along with tons of other arts, like like food, like um, like arts and crafts, like origami, and all the, these things that are part of our culture, and I'd be proud to represent it um, in any unique way that I can. I'm really um, glad you're addressing that issue um, because I have wondered myself: Is it bad that you know these movies and these TV shows? are still using the martial arts hero and the story. You know, they're always ha that always has to be incorporated somehow if there's Asians involved or, you know, whatever. And so I myself have wondered that is like, is that, is that feeding that stereotype? But I'm really glad you just address it in that way that when it's controlled by us in terms of, you know, creating that story and that narrative, for instance, like warrior, uh, the, you know, the, show that Shannon Lee is involved with that Bruce Lee wanted to do 50 years ago. That is, again, being told by creators who are Asian and who are know how to take the story and not stereotype it. So yeah, no, I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that, Ludi, because I've always wondered myself, because I think that's a yeah. legit question that people ask. And I love I love Warrior. I love shows like Warrior. I Me think too. I think um, Justin Lin and Shannon. I think they really know that they really grasp the idea that um, change doesn't happen very quickly. And if it's very quickly, it's too hard to swallow. It's like when I was a kid, my mom always wanted me to grow um, big and fat because it's healthy, 
you know, we, we came from a place where there is actually scarcity. So she would stuff food down my throat, but I can't take it. I can't swallow it. I ended up really hating the food. I can't taste it. It's, I'm like, I'm, I'm literally like a duck getting force fed. But I think warrior, um, it encompasses so many different um, like factions and, and different stories and different interests in that era. There's the Irish, there's the American government, and yep. then there's the factions in, in Chinatown. And, um, and I think this, these are the stories that are really wonderful that I see us inching towards because it's not, I think we really need to stop this idea of otherness and start thinking about how to get togetherness, yeah. you know? And yeah. I think that's the way to represent a story is when you see it, you go, oh, think people are together and they're familiar and they're interacting and, and that's all we need. And there's history that has been yeah, untold, you know? Uh, yeah. history of the Asian American experience, which Warrior, even though it's fictional, it does it does utilize historical events and things that actually did happen as well. And so it is a, a lesson in history to a certain extent showing that Chinese immigrants have been here since the 1800s and this is the struggle they went through and this is the oppression and this is you know, this is what they had to deal with. So it's that kind of storytelling that can be also really powerful when it, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that HBO Max um, picked up the third season. Right? Yeah, it's wonderful. That was huge news. That was huge news. It's wonderful. Let's talk about you, though. Kung Fu has done it phenomenally well, too. Yeah, so, I, I mean, Warrior and Kung Fu kind of share the same history, Yeah. right? They, right. they, they kind of join together at where, like, 90%. If there's, if Dwayne Johnson is representing one-third of all Asian lead roles, yeah. then I think probably the other two-thirds all stem from Bruce Lee. Totally, yes. Right, because, because <laughs> Kung Fu and Warrior also came from the same treatment that Bruce Lee wrote. Um, and then it t turned into the Kung Fu in the seventies by David Carradine. And then, yeah, Bruce, got, Bruce got screwed on, on both projects. People have to understand yeah, that he yes. created warrior. He wrote it and it was rejected, right? Yes. He w wanted to be in Kung Fu as the lead. And they said, no, we're going to get this white guy, David Carradine to play the, to the lead role. So he got screwed on both projects. Right. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I, I, I hope, I really hope Bruce understands. I think, I think he does because he's such a, he's such a forward thinker, like a yeah. philosopher. That um, also, this will take time. So whether or not he meant it or not, he, he planted those seeds, yeah. and now we're reaping from it. Yes. And for Kung Fu, I'm so proud to be of this series because I feel like I don't know if this is the way um, the the creators uh, like uh, Christina Kim. And CW meant it, but I thought it was quite sub subversive because I know it's kung fu, yeah. and that draws you in. But when you start to watch it, you realize it's representing, it's trying its best to do justice to an Asian or Chinese American family mm. running a dumpling shop. It's mm -hmm. really about the relationships and the intricacies of this family. So when you get drawn in by the title Kung Fu and then it smacks you with a family drama, <laughs> with romance, with, with love triangles, with all this, with all these other things. So it's like, Hey man, whatever works because it's obviously, <laughs> it's obviously working. You know, people are loving the show. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's, um, I'm very excited. I think, um, yeah. I think I, yeah, I come on soon and then, um, I've had a, I've had a really good time. It just feels like when you're walking on set with a group of Asians, you, you feel like you, you don't need to fit in, but you belong, uh, you know? Yes, 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 yes. See, that's a beautiful thing to feel like you're not the other, you f to, f not, to not be made to feel like you are the outsider. All right. So and let me ask you some other questions about you because I'm so curious. Are you still vegan? Are you vegan? I am still vegan. I, I don't think that's about to change ever. <laughs> Have think, you been vegan think, a while? Like, when did you go I've vegan? Been, I've been vegan for the past five years. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry to switch gears like that. I just, I don't know why it's vegan popped into my head. So five years. So what has that done for you? Because here's, here's the myth, right? That a lot of people believe that vegans can't be muscular and strong and, you know, kind of be like, 
you know, uh, physically fit and all that because it's like you're not getting your protein, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I was a vegetarian for a long time, so, and I was also a raw foodie for a while. Um, so it's not true. So I know that's not true. But why did you decide to go vegan? I think it was the only thing that made sense because I want to I want to keep playing this game. It's a lot of fun. So I don't want it to get, end anytime soon. Um, so it's the only thing. And by by game, I mean my physical health and I mean what's good for the world. Yeah, um, I guess I guess I've got this like one rule uh, and it goes if I if I start something, I want to make sure that I can keep up for the rest of my life mm. and maybe even beyond. And that's the only. Wow, that's, that's a only, lot of pressure, I would, Ludi. <laughs> I, mean, the, <laughs> I mean, I think that's what I learned from from getting exercise and fitness. I was quite an overweight kid. Were um, you? Yeah, I was. I was super overweight because I thought uh, you you you're not a gamer, but I was a huge video gamer. Yeah. I've got. <laughs> I keep vacillating between these two things. When I was a kid, I went, um, "Why play sports when you can just play it on TV?" <laughs> That's right? awesome. And then and then I vacillated to the other extreme where where I went, um, you know, like you got to play sports in real life because no amount of TV gaming is going to help you survive in the wild. Right. You're going to have to face reality <laughs> sooner or later. Yeah. And with veganism, um, I guess it's that imitation thing, too. I know gorillas, they, they eat plants. That's yeah. all they eat. That's true. There's strong as heck. Yeah, um, that is very true. Cows. So it's, I mean, they make protein, yeah. you know, yeah. we eat them because they eat plants. Right. And why don't we just go to the direct source and make muscles and protein from that? It's totally, it's totally possible. Not as it possible. It's, um, it's just better for my, for my mind, for my spirit, for my body, for yeah. everything. Yeah. I feel great. Well, let's talk about your body for a second. I'm going to totally objectify you for one second. So when I watch Mortal Kombat, you know, when you, we first meet you, you know, you, you have like a, you know, a, a clothes on and, you know, you can't really see your body. Right. And so you just look like this nice guy in, in, in the movie and you're, you're kind of helping them, you know, get, get ready for, you know, their, their big combat mission. Uh, and then all of a sudden we see you with your shirt off. And I literally, I was like, Oh my God, look at this guy's body. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you were like so cut, but not just cut, but like big and like really super duper hit, uh, fit like a superhero. So is that how you normally, uh, do you look like that now? Can you take your shirt? I'm just kidding. No, but seriously, uh, you obviously had to get very buffed out for the movie, but is that part of like your regular sort of like fitness? You want to be that fit? always do i want to be that fit i don't know i i just am usually if i keep up my my usual routine i i just am the way i eat the way i the way i work out the way i move um for mortal Kombat, it was i, I knew i need to tailor it to i mean if you look at the video games i'm nothing yeah okay video, well that's a video, video game. game guys are really jacked up <laughs> but for me you know if i didn't hit that hit that movie running yeah um then I would have never made it to the finish line. Right. It would have been impossible because right. uh, the time we had to prepare wasn't enough. Um, just in case, it's it's way easier for me to eat a bunch of vegan donuts and gain a lot of weight if I need to go for uh, yeah. some yeah. other you know lesser lesser physically demanding role yeah. than um, to get really fit in no time at all. Um, but yeah, so so it's like that. It's just it's just part of my life. I it's mean, it's a lifestyle life. thing for you, which is awesome yeah. because. The reason I bring this up, all kidding aside, is that you you sometimes see actors or actresses get, you know, very fit and uh, buffed out for a role, right? Because that's what the role demands. But then you yeah. see them afterwards and they're back to sort of dad bod, you know. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's nice to hear that this is actually part of who you are and part of your lifestyle of, of health. Yeah. yeah. The the um the reactions have been really interesting because that's one other thing I started doing on this film that I've never done before is for some reason I started reading uh, reviews okay and comments and I usually start with a one star because they're the most fun <laughs> because people are like don't read reviews but for some reason I'm really this is why I say I might have might have had an aneurysm during um, the <laughs> pandemic because um, it's been a really good time for me because I, I understand that it somehow clicked all of a sudden that they're not lying. 
they actually have these opinions. So um, for me to take it in, I'm just, I'm just listening to it. I mean, it doesn't have to affect me, but it's, you know, it's some information and some exchange. I don't want to shut people out. Right. Um, and if I disagree, then I disagree. So what? Right. So, I mean, some of the comments I've been reading, it's like they like, border from amusing to like outright really destructive, you know, and like, and do you remember I some, really disagree do you remember some like, of them? There's some like Liu Kang is so pretty, you know, <laughs> and then it ranges to, uh, petrol head says why Liu Kang is like those K pop boy band. <laughs> BTS, yay! Oh my god, right. that's funny. <laughs> Ludi Lin be looking like that last boss from Little Monsters. <laughs> um, Ludi became thin to be Liu Kang. He oh. was swole as Power Rangers. Oh. Um, I mean, it's not all. Okay, it's very not horrible. Few and far between are really negative. Okay. Um, but some are some are really disparaging and really just. Um, uh, like really hurtful to yeah. other okay. factions of society. So, so I won't read those. Okay, wait, but wait, wait, I'm wait, Ludi. Yeah. I have to ask you though. I'm sure you've probably caught some of them by accident, you know, uh, but so how how does oh, that- Oh, not by accident, but on purpose. On purpose. Okay, so you've read some of the really mean ones because there are a lot yeah. of mean jerks out there, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. so it's hurtful. Yeah, so are you able to handle it? How do, I mean- you know, they always say like when you're in a position of fame and, you know, recognition, you have to develop a very thick skin. But you know what I say about that after being in the business for this long, I'm still human. You still feel something. You still feel some hurt when somebody says something pretty vicious. So, so how, how do you, how do you handle it? How do you take it? Well, I mean, I mean, I have not had some proud moments, I have to say. When I do get some like vicious comments, uh, I will strike back. I shouldn't, I really shouldn't, especially on social media because there's so many trolls out there. That's what they want you to do. But there are times when there are such ignorant comments or such inflammatory racist comments. For instance, I just got one the other day and I shot oh, back. I think I saw that one. I shot back. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna let this ass hat get away with this. Um, not that I'm going to change their minds whatsoever, but you know what? You know why I do it, Ludi? There's a certain reason. There's a certain aspect to it. I want other people to see that sometimes you have to fight back. Yeah. That's that's why I do it. It's not that I think it's going to change that particular person, mm -hmm. but I do want to show people that sometimes you have to stand up for yourself. Not always. Right. Not always. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think it's really interesting because I think uh, because I was bullied a lot. And once I started standing up for myself, um, I ended up befriending a lot of bullies that were bullying me because they need to. They, they, I mean, a lot of people test you. Yeah. They need to know that you can. It's like building an alliance. They need to know that you can handle a fight if some, you know, outer force, uh, you know, come and tries to harm you yeah. that they, they have backup. That's the only way you become friends. And some people aren't good at communicating, especially guys. We're really not good at communicating. Yeah, that is true. I mean, <laughs> m my coach told me that the best way of communication happens in a ring with fists because nobody lies. It's it's when someone punches you in the face, it hurts. It's, it's the honest, most honest thing. It just hurts. You can't deny it. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is as I do more martial arts and as I handle as I read more of these comments, and sometimes it's kind of like martial arts for me. It's kind of like a real discipline to learn how to handle these psychologically and in my heart as well. Um, but the more martial arts I know, I notice literally the less fights I actually get into. Either people sense something about you or you just need to know how to handle yourself because you, you know you have that in your back pocket and you can yeah. destroy a person if you want. Um, so you don't have to. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. But I think for if I want to help people or influence people or affect people with my story, then I have to let people affect me and I have to let people see that they're affecting me. If you want someone to be real, then you really have to stay real. Absolutely. Um, I always talk about authenticity and being genuine and vulnerability is part of that, right? Vulnerability is actually a superpower to me.
Because I think once you show vulnerability, once you're willing to be vulnerable, then you're allowing yourself to, you know, feel and you're allowing yourself to be empathetic, sympathetic, understanding, and you're much more aware of yourself and others. Um, and it's I think hard. it's hard. No, no, no. It's hard. And, you know, take it from somebody who's older than you. It, it gets a little bit easier as you get older, because as I always say, um, as you get older, especially women, um, we start, we stop giving a shit about anything. Like we don't care about like what people think and, you know, what people are saying or any, it's a real liberation. It's a very liberating feeling. Um, and so look forward to that as you get older. Um, especially okay. is it is it only women because i notice i mean when i because i live in chinatown uh -huh. so when i'm on the street i really every second day i get a, a i get a grandma coming up to me and giving me life advice and i don't know the person Aww. so yeah I, I really love it the other day this grandma came up to me and just shared these bags of snacks during oh. covid she doesn't she's like i can't eat it alone oh she's, she's alone here right now so it's that's kind of sad Aww. And so she's like, I can't eat everything. So that's why I'm going around to ask people if they want some. Um, but what, so when you say that, especially women, you stop giving a shit about anything. Well, um, you know why I say women and uh, because I am one, but also, but, but in all seriousness, I think women, uh, for so long, we've been, you know, scrutinized and, um, objectified and expected to look a certain way and, you know, act a certain way and, you know, I mean, granted, women now and young women now are becoming much more independent and, you know, uh, and so free of maybe some of these pressures. But still, I think girls and women are still under a lot of pressure by society, you know, to live up to certain expectations, both physically, you know, and mentally um, and play a certain role. And so once you start breaking free of that as you get older, and I think getting older the reason why it gives us that freedom is because, yeah, we don't, we don't have to, we, we don't feel the pressure of living up to anything anymore because we've done it. We've been there, done that. I don't care. Fuck you. You know, seriously, that's how I feel oftentimes. And so I think that there's a little bit of a difference between men and women. Um, men, I also think to a certain extent, as they get older, they also feel a sense of freedom to a certain extent about the pressures, but I think men still have that role in society of maintaining a certain image, a certain position, certain status, you know, all of these things that probably extend their need to try to keep up this image. Does that make sense? It, it does. I, I yeah. can really, I can really um, empathize with that. And it's really sad to me because I feel like yeah. I feel like probably, um, you know, the violence and the prejudice against women is the most prevalent and the most serious human human rights crisis in the world. It is. Because, I mean, yeah. women literally comprise half the world. Yeah. And, and we hold and, up half the sky, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. And I think... I think some cultures don't even realize this. I know, I hope times are changing. And like you said, women, when they get old, they start stop giving a shit. I hope you can have that sense of freedom when you're much, much younger. I hope it starts leaning more toward that way. Um, I hope you're because, right, Ludi. I hope you're right. But you know what? I, I will say this. I think with more people like you who are willing to openly talk about their vulnerabilities and be emotional and be sensitive, and that shouldn't be a bad word when you use it describing a man, right? Because oftentimes it's like, oh, no, you can't be sensitive as a man. I think it's vitally important for men to be much more sensitive and much more aware um, and open themselves up. And that is a, I think that's something that needs to be worked on societally because I, there's obviously a crisis with young men, especially in this country, because they're the ones who are committing all the mass shootings and kind of going off the deep end. There's something going on with the way that boys are being raised. And that yeah. is something that needs to really be addressed. It really does. So when I see someone like you who is, you know, being so open and honest and thin skinned in a good way, um, that gives me hope. So, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm trying, it's a, it's a work in progress every day. Yeah. And every single day when I wake up in the morning, I take myself to school. Um, 
and have to remember that. And sometimes, you know, some days I do better, better than others. Um, as long as you're trying, I, I know, I know I need to do that every single day. And I know that sometimes, and I get into this like conundrum because I get invited to these talks or, or because there's a, a movement in also our Asian community that, um, men have been, uh, uh, demasculinized. Yeah. Yeah, right? demasculated. And, uh, absolutely. And emasculated. Yeah. They want to take back that. And then a lot of these conversations revolve around really traumas. Um, when they're teenagers, they can't get a date. Um, they can't do this. Like the right. perception of how small their penis is and yep. all these private parts. And um, I want to find a gentle way to say, look, man, like I outgrew my penis a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and you're you're so so focused on it, huh? like it's really time to move on. And I think to be a man, you have to you have to have the masculine, you have to be feminine as well. That's yeah. the way to to sort of rethink what the ideal man is, yes. because there needs to be some balance now, right? right? Um, um, people use the excuse of this is how we're born, this is the biology, this is what um, being aggressive. Being yeah. warlike is what men are built to do. Right. Sure, right. it might be, but, but we're better than our biology. That's not no longer an excuse. Our biology isn't built to to hold a phone in one hand right away and have access to literally the entire universe yeah. and be able to handle that and deal with robots on social media. This isn't biology class anymore. You know, yeah. we got to think of a new way to move forward and to deal with this whole world situation and the dynamic between men and women and also between different cultures. Yeah. Like as women comprise 50 percent of the world and Asians are 60 percent of the world. So for an Asian woman at that intersectionality of the majority of people are at a very dis disadvantaged position. And we yeah. really need to address that in some way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ludi, are you single? I, I'm, I'm at an, at an odd place right now. I, 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 um, I'm, I met my girlfriend at the very beginning of the pandemic. So, um, we just got thrown together. We didn't go on a single date and then we moved in and oh. we've been together for, yeah. What? Wait, 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 like whoa, whoa. how did, how does that even work if you never went on a date and then you moved in together? Well, we're, we're traveling a lot and then we're in LA and then we met and then, um, and then we couldn't travel anymore. So then, oh, so um, you mean you didn't, you, you never like went out on a date, but you, it's not like you didn't ever meet before you moved in together. Well, it was kind of like the first time we met, we just, we what? just moved in because it was like, <laughs> it was like the first night she didn't, she didn't have a place. I had a place and then we're to, we've been together ever since. Um, <laughs> and then there's one day that she had to fly to Miami, Miami for a wedding and then she came back and then, and then we've been together ever since. But just recently, um, I'm in Vancouver. I'm doing some work here in Canada, and then she had to go back to Florida. So this is the first time we've been we've been separate, okay. and um, it hasn't been easy. I mean, it's been a really wild ride for me, and that's what I've been. That's why I've been learning so much about huh. about like all these secrets that men didn't know about, like validation, how important that is. Um, <laughs> Like love languages do matter. Oh all these yes, things. have you and, ever read and the and they're and they're really great. Like, have you I ever read the book, idea. The Four Love Languages? Yeah, apparently there's five. And, oh, so and is there it might five? Be, there might okay, be there's six, five. Yeah. Okay, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I've read the book because someone told me. Like I literally just read it last year. For but it's been out for decades. It's fascinating. It is fascinating. Yeah. 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 When you get it wrong, it can be disastrous. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, so you guys are together, but you're, you know, you're obviously reassessing stuff because of yeah, that. yeah, we're we're working it out. Okay, we're working it out. Okay, and I good. think that's um, I think every single relationship is that kind of negotiation every day. It's like with yourself too, self learning and and yeah. and interpersonal le learning. Absolutely, you need to take your relationship to school every day oh, as well. No, and there's no such thing as a perfect relationship. And you're bringing two different people together to, you know, make it work somehow. And so it is constant work. It is constant work yeah. and it c communication. That's the yeah. most important thing. I always thing. try to remember that we're all heartbroken and brain damaged people. <laughs> yeah. 
And yes, that actually, I will agree with that because again, I have many years on you, so I have gone through many of those um, in my time. And yes, I've learned a great deal over the years. Uh, but it is about being open and honest, and very good at communicating. Very good at communicating. Mm -hmm. So, those are all important. Ludi, what a pleasure! I, I have so enjoyed talking to you. Honestly, in it, oh, likewise. I mean, we've talked about like everything under the sun, which is awesome. Um, but I wish you so well and continued success in your career. Uh, but even more importantly, your development as a human being, because you are so on your way as this evolved man who has both masculine and feminine qualities, like you're saying, which is so, so important. So I'm just so happy to see that in somebody like you. And then also what you represent to the Asian community um, and to improving representation overall. So thanks for all that you're doing. Thanks, May. You're you're a real inspiration. I um, I watch your stuff and I read your history, and it's it's amazing. You're like I didn't have many role models growing up, and I think you're definitely a, a great role model for a lot of young people out there, and for people that are just lost and finding their way. And I appreciate your thought that you know I I. I'm evolving into something. I, I, I don't think I'll ever get there, but I'll have fun getting there. So as long, exactly. As good. long as you're doing the work and you're on that journey, that's all that matters. So, so keep doing it. But Ludi, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. And, um, Hey, maybe someday we'll be able to meet face to face. Let's hope. Mm, pleasure's all mine. I count yeah. on it. Thanks. Okay. All right. All right. Have a good day. Well, that was definitely a fun and uh, much deeper conversation than I expected to have with Ludi Lin. Uh, so thanks Ludi for your time. And also for those of you who think that I was asking him if he was single because I was like interested, I'm no cougar people, I'm no cougar. I was asking because I thought, oh, what a nice young man. If he's single, I wonder if I know any nice young women I would set him up with. <laughs> That's basically what I was thinking. It was like, I was being like Auntie May, you know. Uh, anyway, but that was fun. Um, so hope you guys enjoyed that conversation and that episode and, uh, yeah. And enjoy the rest of Asian Pacific American heritage month, continue to celebrate our stories and our identity and our history and all the good stuff, because we certainly deserve it. And we certainly deserve to be recognized. Uh, and we have to keep telling our stories in our voices. That's really important. All right. And uh, for those of you who aren't following me yet or the show, uh, go to Instagram, follow The May Lee Show, go to Twitter, May Lee Show, uh, Facebook, of course, and then subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and keep on watching these videos. And uh, if you can give us a rating on any of the podcast platforms like Apple, uh, that would be great. Um, great ratings, good reviews always help. Okay. All right. Have a good one, everyone. I will see you next time.